Heart failure is a condition in which the heart fails to pump adequate amounts of blood into the systemic circulation, to meet the metabolic demands of the tissues. Depending upon the cause, heart failure may be classified to low output failure or high output failure. Low output failure is a reduced pumping efficiency of the heart that is caused by factors that impair cardiac function, such as myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction, or cardiomyopathy. But in high output failure, the cardiac output is normal or elevated, but still cannot meet the metabolic and oxygen need of the tissues. And that may be caused by hyperthyroidism, that causes hypermetabolism, or anemia that causes reduced oxygen carrying capacity. Heart failure is also classified to left heart failure and right heart failure. Let's discuss their causes and manifestations. As we know from the CVS introduction lecture, the left side of the heart is responsible for pumping oxygenated blood from the lungs, to the peripheral tissues of the body. The most common causes of left heart failure include, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy and chronic hypertension. Step by step let's see what happens in this condition. First, left side pump failure occurs, that leads to a decreased stroke volume, which is the volume of blood pumped by one ventricle during one contraction. So increase the amount of blood, that fills the left ventricle during relaxation, which is called left ventricular and diastolic volume. And that means increased preload. Then, blood pools in the ventricle and atrium, and eventually backs up into the pulmonary veins and capillaries. Leading to congestion of blood in the pulmonary circulation, and that causes pulmonary pressure and pulmonary edema. That's why left heart failure is also referred to as congestive heart failure, due to the pulmonary congestion of blood that accompanies the condition. And that results in, dyspnea, cough, frothy sputum, rails or crackling sounds, that may be heard through a stethoscope, as a result of fluid accumulation in the lungs. Difficulty breathing when lying down, or known as orthopnea. The accumulation of fluids and dyspnea, that are often worse at night, or when the patient lies in the supine position, because blood and fluids from the lower limbs may redistribute into the pulmonary circulation. Poor perfusion of systemic circulation that may lead to cyanosis. Generalized fatigue and muscle weakness. Right heart failure often arises as a consequence of left heart failure. As a result of the increased pulmonary pressure that accompanies left heart failure, the resistance to blood flow from the right ventricle to the lungs is significantly increased. Over time, the increased workload on the right ventricle leads to dilation, and eventual failure of the right heart. Right heart failure may also result from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and cystic fibrosis. Increased right ventricular workload causes venous congestion and distension. Backed up blood distends the visceral veins, especially the hepatic vein. As the liver and spleen become engorged, their function is impaired. Rising capillary pressure, forces excess fluid from the capillaries into the interstitial space, causing edema, weight gain, and nocturia. So how the body responds to all of that? When heart fails, cardiac output decreases, leading to a decrease in blood pressure, and that decreases renal perfusion, leading to, activation of sympathetic nervous system, and renin release by juxtaglomerular cells and renal afferent arterioles, due to both the decreased renal perfusion and sympathetic stimulation of beta-1 receptors. And as we know from the previous lectures, renin ultimately leads to the production of angiotensin II in the plasma and the release of aldosterone from the adrenal gland. Angiotensin II is a powerful vasoconstrictor, that increases systemic blood pressure, while aldosterone acts on the kidney tubules, to increase salt and water retention, and that will increase systemic blood pressure and cause edema. Heart failure also increases venous return, which increase capillary filtration, causing edema. Faced with a chronic increase in workload, the myocardium responds by increasing its muscle mass, known as ventricular hypertrophy. Although increased muscle mass can increase cardiac output in the short term, contractility eventually suffers.
as the metabolic demands of the hypertrophied myocardium continue to increase, and the efficiency of contraction decreases. So the drugs that can be used in the management of heart failure are, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, aldosterone antagonists, beta blockers, diuretics, vaso and venodilators, and inotropic drugs. And that what we're going to discuss in the next lectures. Before we start talking about drugs, we should know that chronic heart failure is typically managed by fluid limitations, less than 1.5 to 2 liters daily, and low dietary intake of sodium, less than 2,000 mg per day. The first category used to manage heart failure is the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors, which we already know are divided to, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers and aldosterone antagonists. Angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or known as ACE inhibitors, such as captopril and enolapril. They block the enzyme that cleaves angiotensin 1 to form the potent vasoconstrictor angiotensin 2. They also diminish the inactivation of bradykinin. So, vasodilation occurs as a result of two actions, the decreased levels of the vasoconstrictor angiotensin 2 and increased levels of bradykinin, which is a potent vasodilator. Also by reducing angiotensin II levels, ACE inhibitors also decrease the secretion of aldosterone. So how ACE inhibitors work in heart failure? ACE inhibitors decrease vascular resistance, afterload, and venous tone, preload, resulting in increased cardiac output. And as we said, by reducing angiotensin II levels, ACE inhibitors also decrease the secretion of aldosterone, so decrease salt and water retention. ACE inhibitors may be considered for patients with asymptomatic and symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Patients with the lowest ejection fraction show the greatest benefit from use of ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are also indicated for patients with all stages of left ventricular failure. They may be used in combination with diuretics, beta blockers, digoxin, aldosterone antagonists, and hydrolyzine, isosorbide dinitrate fixed dose combination, depending on the severity of heart failure. Adverse effects of this group include postural hypotension, renal insufficiency, so serum creatinine levels should be monitored, particularly in patients with underlying renal disease, hyperkalemia so potassium levels must be monitored, particularly with concurrent use of potassium supplements, potassium-sparing diuretics, or aldosterone antagonists due to risk of hyperkalemia. Adverse effects also include, dry cough, and angia edema. The second group is angiotensin receptor blockers, such as losartan and valsartan. They are competitive antagonists of the angiotensin II type 1 receptor, so they block angiotensin II action, and they don't affect bradykinin levels. Although angiotensin receptor blockers have a different mechanism of action than ACE inhibitors, their actions on preload and afterload are similar. Their use in heart failure is mainly as a substitute for ACE inhibitors in those patients with severe cough or angia edema, which are thought to be mediated by elevated bradykinin levels. The third group is aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone and aplaranone. They are antagonists of aldosterone, thereby preventing salt retention. Aldosterone antagonists are indicated in patients with more severe stages of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and recent myocardial infarction. The second category used in management of heart failure is beta blockers. Three beta blockers have shown benefit in heart failure. Bisoprolol, carvedilol, and long acting metoprolol succinate. Carvedilol is a non selective beta adrenoreceptor antagonist that also blocks alpha adrenoreceptors. Whereas bisoprolol and metoprolol succinate are beta 1 selective antagonists. Beta blockers prevent the changes that occur because of chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system. They decrease heart rate and inhibit release of renin in the kidneys. In addition, 
beta blockers prevent the deleterious effects of norepinephrine on the cardiac muscle fibers, decreasing remodeling, hypertrophy, and cell death. Beta blockade is recommended for all patients with chronic stable heart failure. Bisoprolol, carvedilol, and metoprolol 6 nate reduce morbidity and mortality associated with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The third category is diuretics. Diuretics relieve pulmonary congestion and peripheral edema. These agents are also useful in reducing the symptoms of volume overload, including orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Diuretics decrease preload as they decrease plasma volume, and subsequently decrease venous return to the heart. And this decreases cardiac workload and oxygen demand. Diuretics may also decrease afterload also by reducing plasma volume, thereby decreasing blood pressure. Loop diuretics are the most commonly used diuretics in heart failure. And the last category we'll discuss today is vaso and venodilators. Organic nitrate esters have a direct relaxant effect on vascular smooth muscles, and the dilation of coronary vessels improves oxygen supply to the myocardium. The dilation of peripheral veins, and in higher doses peripheral arteries, reduces preload and afterload, and thereby lowers myocardial oxygen consumption. Arterial dilators, such as hydrolyzine, reduce systemic arteriolar resistance and decrease afterload. If the patient is intolerant of ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, or if additional vasodilator response is required, a combination of hydrolyzine and isosorbide dinitrate may be used. Common adverse effects with this combination are headache, hypotension, and tachycardia. Hydrolyzine has been rarely associated with drug-induced lupus. In this lecture we'll talk about the second part which is the inotropic drugs. We'll go through three groups, digitalis glycosides, beta agonists and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. We'll talk about their mechanisms, trade names and uses. Positive inotropic agents enhance the force of contraction of the heart, so they increase cardiac output. Although these drugs act by different mechanisms, the inotropic action is the result of an increased cytoplasmic calcium concentration, that enhances the contractility of cardiac muscle. Again, when calcium concentration increase, force of contraction increases, and cardiac output increases, which we need to manage heart failure. The first group in this category is cardiac glycosides, or also known as digitalis glycosides. They are a group of chemically similar compounds that come from the digitalis plant, or known as foxglove. The most widely used agent is, digoxin. Now let's discuss the exact mechanism of this agent at a cellular level. There is a membrane-bound catalytic enzyme called sodium-potassium ATPase enzyme. This enzyme hydrolyzes ATP to produce energy, and this energy is needed for sodium to get out of the cell in exchange with potassium. Digoxin inhibit this enzyme, so intracellular sodium concentration will increase. So what happens is that sodium has to go out, so cardiac fibers possess another mechanism, which is exchange the intracellular sodium for extracellular calcium, so the cardiac fibers will extrude sodium in exchange with calcium without consuming energy. Leading to increased intracellular calcium and inhibition of extrusion of calcium outside the cells and also releasing calcium stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All this will increase the concentration of calcium intracellularly, so myocardial contractility will increase, increasing the cardiac output. Vagal tone is also enhanced, so both heart rate and myocardial oxygen demand decrease. Digoxin slows conduction velocity through the AV node, making it useful for atrial fibrillation. Digoxin therapy is indicated in patients with severe heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, after initiation of ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and diuretic therapy. Digoxin is available in oil and injectable formulations. It has a long half-life, of 30 to 40 hours.
it is mainly eliminated intact by the kidney, requiring dose adjustment in renal dysfunction. Very important to know that digoxin has a very narrow therapeutic index, and digoxin toxicity is one of the most common adverse drug reactions leading to hospitalization. Anorexia, nausea, and vomiting may be initial indicators of toxicity. Patients may also experience blurred vision, yellowish vision, xanthopsia, and various cardiac arrhythmias. Decreased levels of serum potassium, known as hypoglymia, predispose a patient to digoxin toxicity, because digoxin normally competes with potassium for the same binding site on the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So how toxicity can be managed? Toxicity can often be managed by discontinuing digoxin, determining serum potassium levels, and replenishing potassium if indicated. Severe toxicity resulting in ventricular tachycardia may require administration of antiarrhythmic drugs and the use of antibodies to digoxin, digoxin immune fab, which bind and inactivate the drug. Digoxin should also be used with caution with other drugs that may cause hypoglymia, such as thiazide or loop diuretics, and with drugs that slow AV conduction, such as beta blockers, veripamil, and diltiasm. The second group of the inotropic drugs is beta agonists, such as dobutamine and dopamine. Improve cardiac performance by causing positive inotropic effects and vasodilation. Dobutamine is the most commonly used inotropic agent other than digoxin. Beta adrenergic agonists lead to an increase in intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate or CAMP, which results in the activation of protein kinase. Protein kinase then phosphorylates slow calcium channels, thereby increasing entry of calcium ions into the myocardial cells and enhancing contraction. Both drugs must be given by intravenous infusion and are primarily used in the short-term treatment of acute heart failure in the hospital setting. And the last group we'll talk about today is phosphodiesterase inhibitors, such as milrinon. Like beta-adrenergic agonists, it increases the intracellular concentration of CAMP. This results in an increase of intracellular calcium, and therefore, cardiac contractility. That's all for now about heart failure. We are waiting for your comments and opinions about this topic. In the next lecture we'll start talking about cardiac arrhythmias, so subscribe and wait for the upcoming videos.